Hello and welcome to Back to the Science. I'm Dr. Susan Oliver and I'm a scientist and this is Cindy Oliver and she's a dog. Now a while ago I started a series of videos on logical fallacies but there has been so much misinformation going around lately that I've been too busy debunking it to make any new videos in the series. But as luck would have it, a few people have alerted me to a new video on Chinese vaccines by Dr. John Campbell that contained both misinformation and a logical fallacy. So I have decided to kill two birds with one state. The logical fallacy he commits is the appeal to tradition fallacy. And this occurs when it is assumed that something is better or correct simply because it's older, traditional, or has always been done. And although people succumbing to this fallacy don't like new stuff, it is in fact a very old fallacy. This is a preprint of an article that appeared in the Saturday Evening Post on the 8th of February 1930 about the initial scepticism towards cars. Many people couldn't understand why you would want to replace the horse, which had served humans well for centuries. Of course, most people now accept that cars are more practical than horse-drawn carriages in most situations, and I'm sure that includes Dr John Campbell. But he does still succumb to the appeal to tradition fallacy with regards to other topics. And believe it or not, in his video on Chinese vaccines, he does it twice. So let's look at the first time. And just before we go on, we will look at the way that the Chinese give the vaccines. Uh, another reason I'm not too concerned about the vaccination program uh, in China. So here's, I think this one, I can't remember where this one was, but it's a Western one. So the vaccine goes in and straight in and no aspiration. Now this nurse in China, uh, she pops the needle in. This is in a slow-mo. And then she aspirates to make sure she's not in a vessel. And only then, only then, only then does she inject it. So two different uh, vaccines with two different approaches uh, to uh, vaccination. Now, the aspiration technique was first introduced in the early 1900s, so it certainly has a lot of tradition behind it. But as with a lot of techniques from that long ago, it is no longer recommended in most countries, and there are a number of reasons for this. The first reason is that it simply isn't necessary. This is from a peer-reviewed article in the British Journal of Nursing, which explains the technique that should be used for administering COVID vaccinations. It is quite a detailed article which covers a number of aspects of correctly injecting COVID vaccines, and this is what it says in relation to aspiration. Aspiration of the plunger is not required due to the absence of large blood vessels at designated injection sites for COVID-19 vaccination. Aspiration is only required when the dorsogluteal site is used, which is no longer recommended for IM injection due to proximity to large blood vessels and the sciatic nerve. The second reason is that most people were never doing it right in the first place. This article was published in 2006 in what is now JAMA Pediatrics, and it covers the results of a survey into injection techniques. And what they found was that only 3% of pediatricians and nurses who were still aspirating were actually doing it correctly. And the correct way of doing it is to draw the plunger back slightly and then wait for five to 10 seconds. We won't wait, we'll just continue. If after that you don't see any blood in the syringe, no, I can't see any, you then depress the plunger. Of course, you wouldn't be using a syringe this big, you'd use a tiny one, but this one's easier to see in the video. And the reason for waiting five to 10 seconds is because it can take that long for the blood to travel up the needle into the syringe. So if you depress the plunger before this time, 
the whole exercise is pointless. And if you recall the video that John was praising, the nurse didn't wait for five to 10 seconds. She just pulled out the plunger and then injected. So John was praising a totally pointless exercise that wouldn't have been able to detect if a needle was in a large blood vessel, even if there were any large blood vessels in the area. And generally, aspiration is not an effective technique to determine if you are in a major blood vessel or not. In this study, they looked at the effectiveness of aspiration for determining if the needle was in a vein when performing steroid injections. And they determined that it was not reliable and in fact missed 50% of cases. So aspiration is unnecessary, doesn't necessarily work, and most people are doing it wrong anyway. So suggesting people should be doing it is committing the appeal to tradition fallacy. Of course, sometimes it is nice to keep up traditions, And that is fine as long as there is no harm in them. But in the case of aspiration, there actually is potential harm because aspiration makes injection more painful. And most people don't like pain, including me. And if you would like more details on why aspiration is no longer recommended from an actual medical practitioner, Dr. Yan Yu has made an excellent video about it, and I'll provide a link to it in this video's description. Okay, so that's John's first appeal to tradition fallacy in the video, but he also has another one. It is a completely uh, different approach to vaccination. It's the tried and tested traditional approach to vaccination, not using a new novel technology using technology that's been around for over 100 years. Well, over 100 years. How's that for an appeal to tradition? A tried and trusted vaccine using technology that has been around for well over 100 years. The vaccine that John is talking about here is the Chinese Sinovac vaccine, which is an inactivated virus vaccine. The first inactivated virus vaccine was the influenza vaccine that was introduced in 1936, which is a little bit less than 100 years ago, but there were some inactivated bacteria vaccines earlier than that, which I guess is what John meant. Of course, if you really want to go with tradition, the first vaccines were live attenuated virus vaccines, and many of these are still used today now the the the, uh, the chinese vaccine the sinopharm vaccine is not uh, an mrna vaccine it does not get into cells and uh, stimulate the cell's own genetic material to stimulate the antigen to stimulate the antibody and the other immune responses it does not use an adenovirus vector to go into the cells to stimulate the cell's own genetic material to make the antigen that stimulates the immune response it does none of that it's just a plain old-fashioned dead uh, virus basically dead viral material um nothing complicated wow those mrna and viral vector vaccines sure sound scary well they sure sound scary if you have limited scientific literacy regarding biology and immunology and there's nothing wrong if you do because not everyone needs to know things like that But if you do have literacy in those areas, you would know that mRNA vaccines don't stimulate your genetic material because mRNA produces proteins from the cytoplasm of cells, not from the nucleus. And you would also know that transporting mRNA into cells and getting the cells to make antigens is exactly the same thing that viruses do, as well as attenuated virus vaccines, except as well as getting the cells to make antigens, they also assemble them into more virus particles so that they can infect more cells. The difference is, whereas if you are infected by a virus or injected with an attenuated virus vaccine, mRNA is delivered into cells via a 
virus particle with mRNA vaccines. It is delivered via a lipid nanoparticle. Ooh, lipid nanoparticles. That sounds new and scary. Yeah, no. Lipid nanoparticles have been used in FDA-approved medication since 1995. Not so new and scary. And the first clinical trial combining lipid nanoparticles and mRNA was in 2014. So it's not exactly new technology. Of course, this still doesn't explain why we wouldn't want to use one of the tried and trusted vaccine technologies instead of these newfangled mRNA or viral vector vaccines. Actually, viral vector vaccines aren't new either. They have already been used for Ebola vaccines, but mRNA vaccines haven't been commercialised before now. So why were they used? Well, John has a theory. I wonder why we didn't do this in the West. Because what you can do is basically you can just brew up huge amounts of this virus. You just do it in a, in a, you have a cell culture. You can proliferate the cells in huge vats, and uh, you, you, you can you can make up uh, huge amounts of uh, virus. Basically, kill the virus and inject it. And there's no compli uh, there's no it's not complicated. It's it's a tried and tested process. Uh, that's what the the approach the Chinese have taken. I don't know why we didn't do that in this country. Let me I can't wonder why that could have been uh, anyway we didn't do that we went for a novel to novel uh, patentable um, uh, technology instead i think that john may be trying to suggest that the only reason mrna vaccines were used in the west was because they could be patented only problem with that suggestion is that you can still patent inactivated virus vaccines for example this is a patent that was issued in 2016 for a dengue virus vaccine that was based on an inactivated virus. And of course, we also have the Novavax vaccine in the West, which uses a traditional approach. So why were new generation vaccines actually developed? Same reason cars were developed. Although horse and carriages were effective transport options, it didn't mean they didn't have shortcomings. And it is the same with traditional vaccines. So this slide shows the key advantages and disadvantages of live attenuated virus vaccines versus inactivated vaccines. And the advantages and disadvantages of inactivated vaccines that I have listed here, although you can't see them yet because it's blank, but it will, you'll see them later. And they're also relevant to subunit vaccines, which use a key antigen from a virus. For live attenuated virus vaccines, the key advantage is that they produce a strong immune response. And that is because they are a live virus. So the body responds exactly how it responds to a natural live virus. Their disadvantage though is because they are a live virus, they can't be given to immunocompromised or pregnant people. And in some cases, they can mutate into more virulent viruses. And this is what happened with the oral polio vaccine, which is why it is no longer used in most developed countries. For inactivated viruses, the advantages are that they can be given to immunocompromised and pregnant people which is important because these are often the people who are most at risk from the diseases that we vaccinate against. But they have the disadvantage that they don't elicit as strong an immune response as live attenuated vaccines. This can be partly rectified through the use of adjuvants, but adjuvants don't completely fix the problem. And the reason for this is because part of our robust immune response is the formation of memory CD8 T cells or killer T cells, as they're known. And killer T cells generally require antigens to be presented on the surface of cells for them to form. And this doesn't happen with inactivated vaccines. However, with mRNA and viral vector vaccines, you get the advantages of both. 
Like viruses, they use your cells to produce antigens, so you get a full immune response. But because they don't replicate, they can still be given to immunocompromised people and they can't mutate into more virulent viruses. So that's the theory. But do mRNA vaccines actually provide better efficacy? Well, that's what they looked at in this study here, where they compared efficacy against severe disease between people vaccinated with mRNA vaccines and people vaccinated with inactivated vaccines, which is a bit of a tautology. But anyway, and the study was during Omicron times and was looking at people over 30. And what they found was that compared with two doses of mRNA vaccine, three doses of mRNA vaccine provided 87.4% protection against severe disease, whereas three doses of inactivated vaccine only provided 69.6% .6 protection. So the mRNA vaccines are more effective in protecting against severe disease than the inactivated vaccines, which is consistent with what we would expect. Of course, the inactivated vaccines are still pretty good. Going back to current allergies, an inactivated vaccine is like using a seatbelt, whereas an mRNA vaccine is like using a seatbelt and an airbag. And I was thinking about making a reference here to the study that came out showing that unvaccinated people were more likely to be involved in car crashes. But I've decided I won't mention it because I don't want to offend anyone. There seems to be a lot of people going nuts and getting quite, you know, riled up about study. So we won't mention it at all, okay? So if you see anyone succumbing to the appeal to tradition fallacy, please share this video with them. As I previously mentioned, though, there is nothing wrong with following traditions if there is no harm in them, but they can't be used as logical arguments. Now, for a lot of people, there is an event coming up where traditions are often followed. I am talking, of course, about Christmas. And if you are someone who celebrates Christmas, Merry Christmas, and I hope you have a wonderful day. And if you don't celebrate Christmas, I also hope you have a wonderful day doing something that isn't Christmas related. If you'd like to look further into the data I've presented, I've provided links in the video's description. And please remember this video is about the science, but you shouldn't take it as medical advice. For that, you should speak to your medical practitioner. If you've got this far, thank you for listening. And if you've liked or commented on the video, double thank you, because that helps the algorithm and means that more people will see the video. And that you don't even have to say something nice. You can leave something nasty. And even that will help me. Although I'd rather nice stuff, but up to you. Anyway, also, just thank you to everyone who has bought me a coffee. I really appreciate your support. I will be continuing to make more videos about logical fallacies in the future. And I'll also be continuing to make more videos debunking misinformation and maybe a few just general science videos. So if you'd like to see them, please hit the subscribe button. Thank you. You're beautiful, little Cindy. You are. You're beautiful.